members. That's it. We'll we'll start the meeting. Uh, here we have a DFI Road Service with us, so we have an opportunity to hear their presentation and then be able to ask some questions. So, first of all, what I want to do is take any apologies. John. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Brough, Councillor McArdle, Councillor Maguire, Councillor Catherine Kelly, and Councillor Martin McCollum. Okay, thanks. Bernard? Uh, Councillor McPhillips and Councillor Gannon. Okay, thanks, Bernard. Mark? Councillor Alan Rainey and Councillor Roy Crawford. Councillor John McCloughy will join us later in Victor Warrington's outside. So. Okay, Chair Mark. And Paul? Thanks, Chair. Councillor Machen, Councillor Hawks, and Councillor Buchanan. Okay, thank you. And did you want in again, Bernard? No, Eddie. And thanks, Chair. Councillor Donnelly. Okay, thank you. Okay. And have we any declarations of interest? No. Okay. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Daniel here and I'll pop on your mic here. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Daniel has a presentation he's going to talk us through. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm delighted to be here to come to Council today and outline the challenges and successes we've had over the past year in DFI Roads. Unfortunately, my colleague Colin Woods, uh, the Deputy Permanent Secretary, couldn't uh, shake a bad dose of the flu to join me today, so he sends his apologies. <clears throat> I often find myself focusing on the day-to-day -day issues affecting our work locally here in Western Division, so it's a shame Colin couldn't come along to give a much broader perspective of some of the issues affecting the Department and the wider civil service. Colin has... Sorry, Daniel. Can everybody hear? No. Can you maybe Sorry. just... Sometimes their mics aren't as... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Colin has given an undertaking, though, to uh, attend a meeting with Council later this year, should you wish to uh, have that update on the, the broader perspective affecting DFI. Um, as you know, earlier this year, the Secretary of State gave a budget to DFI roads and the budget was a uh, 14% reduction on the resource bullet educate budget allocation for this year when compared to last. I'm sure you appreciate that this presents a significant challenge to the department to continue to provide the level of service expected by the public and yourselves. This year's capital funding allocation for structural maintenance is similar to last year's with an initial allocation of 85 million pounds for the department. This level of investment is welcome and helps towards the 143 million pounds a year required to keep our roads in their current condition. However, it's significantly less than that. And if you take into account that this calculation was carried out in 2019, and if you adjust for inflation, uh, that would be 190 million pounds today, you can appreciate uh, we're operating a significant shortfall. Um, there are unlikely to be additional allocations throughout the year and in the absence of an assembly. So the report submitted to Council by necessity reflects the current allocation. If further monies do become available, we hope to be in a position to utilise them for additional resurfacing and maintenance works to maintain our roads infrastructure. We continue to implement a limited service policy across our maintenance activities, which means that only the most severe defects are being repaired. I know that many councillors have contacted the department to question the suitability of this policy. To be clear, we're not implementing this policy because we think it's a good way to maintain our roads or good practice. We've adopted this practice to work within the budget allocated to us. As roads engineers, we're acutely aware of the effect that uh, poor road condition can have on the people of Northern Ireland who use our network. And possibly more significantly, we're aware of the current policy and level of funding may have longer term detrimental effect on the quality of our infrastructure, making it more expensive to maintain our roads in the future. However, we're managing the network as best we can to minimise the safety risks to road users and stay within our budget. The report itself details an extensive list of maintenance, network development, active travel, street lighting and structure schemes, along with network planning statistics completed in 22-23 and programmed for the current year. I'm not going to go through them all in detail, but I'll give a quick snapshot of the scale of the work completed. In 22-23, 
and extending into this year. Obviously, the, the major work from a major works point of view, the department published a prioritised list of major work schemes that so will continue to be progressed. Both the A5 and the Enniskillen bypass were on this list, and the A32 coroner muck improvement was highlighted as a scheme that the department would progress to the end of its current work stage. With regards to the A5, the, um, its progress through the statutory processes and the public inquiry report was issued to DFI A5 project team earlier this month, and they are considering the recommendations. Once the process is completed, then a decision can be made to, to, on the next steps for the scheme. The Enniskillen bypass has completed all statutory procedures and contract documents are being prepared in readiness for procurement when funding is confirmed. Similarly, all statutory procedures are complete for the A32 Corn Muck Road Improvement Scheme and the contract documents are being updated. However, a decision on the delivery of this scheme is dependent on funding and the department's emerging transportation strategy. From a maintenance point of view, 27.5 kilometres of roads were resurfaced in the council area at a cost of about 3.1 million last year, along with 950,000 metres squared of surface dressing at a cost of about a million pounds. There was almost a kilometre of footways resurfaced at a cost of 152,000, and 22,500 road gullies were cleaned in 22-23 out of a total of 35,000 with a significant number of drainage schemes to assist in controlling surface water and maintain roads in a safe and passable condition. There are also approximately 7,415 kilometres of verges cut, over 10,000 priority defects repaired, and 147 winter service call-outs, which is actually up about 50% on last year, on the previous year. There are also 3,524 notifications to ex excavate the highways from other um, utilities companies. From a network development point of view, the local transport safety measures completed schemes to the value of 797,000, including carriageway widening and bus stops on the A5, a further 10 schemes including upgrades of signals, footways and sightline improvements, and the introduction of a number of speed restrictions, warning uh, speed restrictions, waiting restrictions and parking restrictions. From an active travel point of view, we delivered over £870,000 worth of work, including footways, upgrades in Gavahi, in conjunction with the LTSM scheme, four cycling measures completed, including two can crossings, cycleways and footways at Glen Cam Road. There was also £1.198 million, million invested across 17 street lighting schemes. From a structures point of view, there was £655,000 invested in the upkeep of our structures, including 27 schemes varying from parapet replacements to masonry arch repairs and strengthening of inverts, and 69000 in BRS repairs and upgrades. From a network planning point of view, there were 897 planning consultations carried out in the Fermanor and Omer area, along with 43 private streets adopted. We're also moving along with the draft plan strategy which was forwarded to the department in 2022 and which has been uh, adopted. The council have now commenced work on the local policies plan and DFI stand ready to assist. In the current year, we had planned over 39 kilometres of roads to be resurfaced again at a cost of around three million pounds. And we've completed over 450,000 square metres of roads surface dressed at a cost of 660,000. There's also been 1.2 kilometres of footway resurfacing at a cost of around 100,000 and 23 great drainage improvement schemes. As with all previous years, um, since limiting service was introduced, a single set of road gully cleansing with reactive cleaning within budgets is planned. Similarly, outlets and open drains will be cleaned upon inspection by road inspectors to assist in controlling surface water. This year, we also completed two grass cuts along with uh, across the season with additional cuts uh, where safety issues were identified, such as uh, visibility displays. Following a change to our policy to encourage biodiversity on our roadside verges, a single cut will be completed on lower traffic roads moving forward. Um, I mentioned defects in the limited service policy earlier, and unfortunately, since 2015, we've had to bring this in and it will continue in the foreseeable future. And generally speaking, that means all defects on all roads over 50 millimetres will be repaired and defects over 20 millimetres on our trunk road network will be repaired. All others, unfortunately, we, we can't address at this time. We plan to carry out a normal winter servicing, winter service uh, 
salting our roads. <clears throat> From a network development point of view, the LTSM budget is 247,000 this year, and a lot of that is put down to um, the development of de designs rather than the delivery of projects on the ground this year. Um, then they include the development of a design for Durnawilt Park and Ride, a number of traffic calming schemes and numerous changes again to the speed limits, waiting restrictions and the introduction of disabled parking bays. From an active travel point of view, we're in a similar uh, situation where we're engaging in the design in the current year with the plan for delivery the following year. And that includes 11 footway improvement schemes, including puffin crossings to be further developed and delivered and five cycling schemes. From a street lighting point of view, there are 11 schemes costing approximately £2 million planned. And from structures point of view, there's £832,000 planned in investment in the upkeep of our structures and six VRS projects. I know that's a fairly rapid review and, and run down through the, uh, the annual report there. Um, from a personal point of view, I want to thank the members for their correspondence over the last year. What I've found is that there's a clear recognition from councillors that good quality roads, infrastructure acts as an enabler across many sectors, and that it helps to improve the lives of the people who live in the Fermanagh and Oma district area. Much of the correspondence we receive is directly related to improving our roads infrastructure, and I appreciate that all too often our responses are not what you would hope for, and that's mainly due to insufficient resources. I just wanted to reiterate that more often than not, we genuinely see the benefit in fixing those defects highlighted to us or providing that pedestrian crossing that you've asked it, asked for, but our constrained budgets often mean we can't do all that we wish. Until we do get to a point where our budgets genuinely allow us to bring forward more of these requests, I would ask that you continue to work with us as we do what we can to maintain our roads infrastructure. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Okay. Thanks very much, Daniel. And our first speaker then is Earl. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to Daniel and the team co for coming along here this evening. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you, Daniel, and your team for all the, the work that you have done and you intend to do across the district. Just a couple of queries, and I know this is very strategic stuff that we're dealing with here this evening. Uh, just with re regard to response times, if we put uh, an email into yourself, uh, I think the last one I was told it was three weeks response. Is there any way that that be, can be quickened up a bit? Because that seems a, a very long time. If you're dealing with uh, something for a number of constituents in a certain way, and you have to wait for three weeks for a response, uh, especially something that's been highlighted uh, time and time again, uh, can can have a re bit of a response on that one. And just with regard to, you talked about day 32 there and the Cornamuck and Gilgarten League and all of that. I can remember being back uh, and the three councils are mentioned there. We had a, we had a, a cross, cross council delegation, cross party delegation and went to the headquarters in Belfast to meet with the Minister Danny Kennedy. So this is not something that's happened in the last year and a half. Uh, we were told then that this was very much in the plan that that road for the A32 was going to be upgraded at that stage because it was the main route between our, our town of Omaha, county, county town of Tyrone, and the Southwest Acute Hospital in Enniskill, and vice versa, people coming from County Fermanagh to the Omaha Hospital or else going to Alton Galvin. So some, it, was a, it was a major route even back then. I think I'm talking like 20, 2015, 2016, when Minister Candy would have been post. So, uh, as I say, that's not something that's just happened in the last year and a half. So, I don't know what has happened in the intervening years uh, with regard to, to, to that, that part of the road. Just those couple of questions, and I know there are a lot of people want to come on here and more strategic stuff than I have, but uh, I just want to commend you on the work that you have done and the replies that we do get, but it's uh, the timing issue of how, how often or how long it takes to get a, a reply on these matters. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. No, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Um, 
certainly with the response timescales, I mean, it, it is laid out in our customer charter that there's 21 working days or 20 working days is our, our target. Ideally, we want to be responding faster than that. And certainly if there's an issue that's highlighted to us that's a safety issue, then we will try to prioritise those and respond a little quicker. What I would say is we do appreciate that sometimes our timescales do slip and that currently we're running at over 22% vacancies in Western Division. And we have done a, a forward-looking exercise for retirements over the next five years, and that jumps to nearly 48%, unfortunately, in the next five years. So it is it is a, an issue that I think is directly related to our, our current staff complement, which is significantly down prior to or following VES in 2017 there. So I appreciate where you're coming from and we'll certainly do our very best to respond within the timescales or faster. Um, but I'd, I'd ask everyone to appreciate that we're we're working with significant staff vacancies and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to make an excuse. There, there are a number of safety and legislative issues that we're bound to respond to. And then response to correspondence comes below those. So we're focused on on carrying out those first. If you, if you, that's okay. With regards to the A32, um, I appreciate that there's a certain amount of frustration with regards to the delivery of the upgrades that were were agreed, as you say, back in 2015. Unfortunately, those um, those particular upgrades weren't funded since then, and we've had significant reductions in our budgets since 2015. They've had been taken on as far as they can be from, from the department's point of view, uh, using our budget to, to carry out the design of these and, and currently updating the corner muck scheme, which was identified as the as part of the major works project. Um, not as a major works project, but to complete it, uh, the current work stream to bring it on as far as we can. So as soon as funding does become available, we can move it forward to the procurement process. And that's as far as we can take it. <laughs> until now but once funding does become more available that one can be progressed and then similarly if funding becomes available to progress the other schemes that form part of the overall a32 upgrade then we can take those on in, in turn but what i would say is there is a plan in the next um during the next year um to review how the upgrades were prioritized um, and look at whether they're still appropriate depending on our transportation policy and, and future transportation development. That's not to say that they're going to change, but there's certainly a review that keeps them at the top of the agenda. Okay. Stephen. Thank you, Chair, and I'm happy to propose another report uh, from this just initially. Chair, I'd uh, like to thank Daniel and Connor and his team for coming along tonight and presenting it. Uh, I just want to thank them both for, for all the work that's been done to date. You know, it's been a challenging time, of course, but uh, I know from a personal experience, whenever I raise an issue with, with, with the team, you know, they come back fairly fairly swiftly and might not always be what you want to hear, but to come back with the information. And I do understand that, they're, that they've got constraints to and, and challenges, but, you know, whenever there's a big issue locally, I find Connor as well very, very responsive and will do his best to help. So I just want to note that a word of thanks, Chair. The first couple of pages of the report, I suppose, do make stark reading. There's no doubt about that, that the department is facing a 14% reduction, which equates to, in real terms, £192 million. You know, that's shocking. That's a shocking deficit, you know, and it's not really good enough. And I think what we're seeing is the outworkings of 10 plus years of a Tory government and what their, what their austerity measures are starting to do to, well, I wouldn't even say starting to do, what they have done to this part of Ireland, it's shocking. You know, I'd love the opportunity, Chair, to take uh, Chris Heaton Harris or Richie Sunak for a spin around the Ross Nareen Road or the Afternoon Road in the Range Rovers just to see what they're doing to this part of the world in terms of infrastructure. You know, it's 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 not sustainable, so it's not. And uh, the time ahead, you know, I know this is a kind of a more strategic meeting, as, as has been said, but I could raise countless issues with footpaths and Fintna, footpaths and Trillic, but you know, obviously, this is not the, the time for it. But I, I don't see how this is going to be sustainable. You know, as this, as time goes on, and we're going into the winter, frosts coming. You know, 
that's not a good story ahead. And I appreciate you know the work that you're doing, but it's, it's, it, it is a very challenging time ahead, I'm sure, Chair. You know, so just them couple of comments and just to put in record, be thanks to the work that the fellas is doing and all the team uh, to date. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Chair Stephen, <coughs> Seamus. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, probably no surprise that I'm not just going to be as complimentary uh, as the previous. I note that my uh, previous speaker is a Tyrone councillor. And can I just read out a few of the stats here? Uh, structural maintenance drainage for 23-24. 20 projects, 13 of them in Tyrone, 7 in Fermanagh. Uh, now, I do think Fermanagh is bigger than the OMA part of the Fermanagh and OMA Council. So anyway, so that's one stat. Um, resurfacing work, 23-24. Uh, 41 projects, 9 in Fermanagh, 32 in Tyrone. Uh, going back into 22-23 year. Drainage, 29 projects, 25 Tyrone, 4 and Fermanagh. Actually, it's quite shocking when you break it down, down into this. Uh, resurfacing, 22, 23, 38 projects, 38 in Tyrone, 0 in Fermanagh. Uh, is there any explanation, any comments on that? Because to me, that is just shocking. Yeah, uh, with regards to the resurfacing, I think it's we've had a number of correspondence from the council with regards to the resurfacing contracts that were completed or that were challenged back in 2021-22. And unfortunately, that led to no resurfacing contract in a number of areas throughout Western Division, including the Fermanagh area. And that would explain why there's very little resurfacing during that period. Um, as mentioned in the response that was issued to the Council, that the monies that were scheduled for resurfacing within the Fermanagh and Omer area, when there was no contract to be used, they were redistributed to the small scale and environmental contracts. And the small scale contract as a result has spent a significant amount of money and is approaching its financial ceiling because it used up a lot of the resurfacing um, budget that was scheduled for the resurfacing contracts. So that would explain why a number of the resurfacing contracts within the Fermanagh area are down. What I would hope you would see in the next year or the next two years is that there would be a more equitable uh, redistribution of resurfacing schemes. But what I would say is that the resurfacing schemes across the whole division are based upon need. So if there are resurfacing schemes that are required because of the severe deterioration of the road, then the budget and the resurfacing will be targeted at those areas. And that's not to say that there's not a number of areas within the Fermanagh area that aren't deserving of resurfacing. But the, the budget, the limited budget we had have needs to be targeted to those areas that are of most need. And uh, it, that's all well and good, uh, that there. To, to me, uh, the money that was lost in resurfacing due to no fault of the Fermanagh people, or probably yourselves, I think it was some uh, procurement crowd down about Belfast that, that uh, messed up the contracts. But... Uh, I would presume that in the next two years, we should be getting four years worth of re resurfacing done in Fermanagh because uh, of any county in uh, in the six, uh, it's the most in need. But that doesn't explain uh, drainage, where of 29 projects in 22-23, 25 of them were in her own and four were in Fermanagh. And uh, this year of 27 are in Fermanagh and uh, 13 in her own. So 
13, that's uh, 38 uh, in Tyrone over the last two years and 11 in Fermanagh. It almost seems like a, the, uh, a GA score between the two counties, but, you know, we're not even taking in the full county of Tyrone on them stats. No, and I'm more than happy to sit down with my staff to see. Well, is there any explanation for it? Have you any, Daniel, for that? Because that, you know, the resurface, and I know you, that there is uh, an explanation, but there's no explanation for that. Again, the way we prioritise how we carry out our works and how we identify those works that need to be carried out are on a need on the basis of need. <laughs> Fermanagh is the wettest county in Ireland, and uh, if there was ever a county needed drainage work done, it's Fermanagh. So <laughs> that, that that argument does not stack up, Daniel. So uh, I'm sorry, but I will wait for a, a full explanation on that. But that, that is uh, scandalous. To say, I'm more than happy to sit down with my engineers to determine how the schemes were prioritised over the last number of years, and looking forward, how we prioritise schemes moving into the following year. But if those are, if there are schemes that are identified by our inspectors and our engineers that are required, then the ones that are the highest priority are are uh, looked at first. She must the bulk of the schemes that was actually in that report were high value schemes. The A32 culvert collapse. The Knox Road is one of the ones that was on it as well. Gardner's Crossroads. We didn't list every final scheme that was done, a pipe put in, a gully put in. We put down a snapshot of the bulk of where our drainage money went. And unfortunately, it took a lot of money to repair things from historic reasons that weren't done. You know the Gardner's Crossroads yourself. You know how much it took, how long it, the scheme took to go on. It was a drainage scheme that needed to be done, and that's where we put the bulk of our money. We can give you a breakdown of every gully that we put in throughout the county, if that's what you'd like, but it wasn't just one-off schemes. Uh, in fairness, and thanks, Chair, for just letting me in one more time. In fairness, this is the report that's before us that we're talking about. There's 25 uh, last year drainage schemes in her own and four and from Anna, and this year there's nine and no. There's seven in Fermanagh and 13 in Tyrone. And we're talking about a smaller area, about half the size. So uh, there, may, there may be some benefit in breaking down those costs with regards to those lesser number of schemes. As Brian mentioned there, they could be a much higher value scheme. Than the just others. if you take drainage and resurfacing, Fermanagh is coming out okay. absolutely yeah, dreadfully. Thanks, Robert. Okay, all right. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to concentrate here on the A5, and uh, I'm grateful that Seamus Keenan, um, the A5 WTC Deputy Project Director, recently furnished me with some detail about next steps. And uh, we know that uh, the Department received the final advisory report on the public inquiry of 2020 and May of Ju and June of this year from the PAC at the end of October, so we know that much. But I suppose what next? And uh, Seamus is indicating on, on behalf of the team that um, the team is now given careful consideration to the points raised and detailed recommendations made by the PAC before the next step, steps can be taken. It's anticipated that the team will provide the permanent secretary with preliminary options in relation to the next steps by the end of this calendar year by the end of December, following which a detailed response to the PAC advice in the form of a departmental statement will be drafted. And it goes on to say things like contractors are ready, ready to go. So really my question is, um, can DFA Western Division continue their advocacy uh, within the department for the A5 scheme? Uh, everybody knows it's about safety, it's about travel times, it's about connectivity and economic development. So I'm seeking an assurance that, Daniel, at your level, that you will do all in your power to continue to flag this up, the urgency of it, and uh, the need to progress as soon as possible. And then secondly, Chair, um, there's the major issue of traffic congestion in OMA. And I know we're dealing with correspondence about a transport plan and a parking plan. 
uh, but can Daniel say anything about uh, measures that might be taken in the near future uh, to alleviate traffic congestion, Noma, you know, from the town centre way out to Drumore Road is a particular problem. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Barry. Thank you, Barry. Um, certainly with regards to the A5, <clears throat> the department is, is very much keen to, to move this forward. We've been Everybody in this room, I'm sure, has been waiting for it for a number of years now, and I'm more than happy to lend my my voice to to progressing that if I can. Obviously, I sit on a number of meet on a number of um, groups that discuss the A5 and, and progress there. So, yeah, I'm more than happy to do that. With regards to um, traffic within Oma itself, I think we recognise fully that there are issues, and and most of them brook from the the junctions on the A5. And they reflect the the congestion out into the rest of the, the 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 town as a whole. And there are a number of schemes planned on the A5 to improve capacity at a number of the junctions within Oma uh, over the next year. And we're we're currently developing uh, two uh, junction improvements. Um, you mentioned uh, the Dromore Road. That's a, obviously a particular uh, bottleneck, you know, lengthy congestion uh, from the town centre right out to the Moore Road. There are other examples as well. You know, is there any prospect of that road that was talked about from the Kevlin Road out to the Moore Road, which might alleviate congestion and keep traffic moving as well? Um, just put that on the radar as well. Thank you, Chair. And certainly speak to my colleagues in network development and get back to you. Okay, Glenn. Oh, good. Okay, Harley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and I welcome the Daniel's report and the report of the of the team. And uh, certainly within the report, there's there's been progress on you know a number of roads that 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 people have been raising. And you know it's never easy dealing. I understand with the finite budget, and it's even worse if that budget. Has been reduced year on year uh, in light of increasing costs. So it's an unenviable task uh, that the Western Division has. Um, I welcome the support and the the comments in relation to the A5 and the A32, and just in relation to what I'd say shovel ready schemes. You know that aren't been obviously the A5 is unique in that um, it's a flagship project that's been delayed for too long and, and it's it's in a category of its own. But other other shovel ready schemes like the A32, um, previously uh, road service would have, the department would have availed of funding through the monitoring rounds uh, when there was an executive operating installment. Uh, and I suppose I want to seek assurances that, that bids are being made to the permanent secretary. I assume there's an equivalent type of monitoring round, and I'm not suggesting there's a lot of money being returned from departments, but I do know that previously road, ser road service and the Department for Infrastructure had the advantage of being able to move quickly if there was any money that became available. So just to seek assurance in, in that regard, Chairman, thank you. Okay, thanks, Glenn. No, absolutely, you're, you're right. The, the nature of the work that we carry out allows us to spend significant amounts of money in short periods of time if we have schemes ready to go. We do have uh, schemes ready to go and unfortunately our current budget takes us to the other side of Christmas and then we we start to run out of money for to carry out our resurfacing schemes that's not to say our uh, patching and, and everything like that won't uh, continue but we are in a position to take money if it becomes available definitely and as you quite rightly noted unfortunately at the minute with no assembly it means moving money with between departments has become a lot more difficult and at the minute, I understand that there's also a um, a process being carried out by the Department of Finance where they're looking to um, bring money back into the uh, Department of Finance rather than redistribute it. So, you know, that it, it, this year is particularly difficult with regards to, to you know, levering, leveraging that additional money. Okay. Josephine. Thank you, Chair. And I too would like to welcome Daniel and his team here this evening. And 
thank him most sincerely for giving us your time. Um, in common with all public services, you have seen a very significant reduction in your budget. And, uh, you know, I acknowledge that. And um, you have also referred to staff shortages. So just really want to express my appreciation to your staff for the hard work that they do in uh, what are very challenging uh, circumstances. And, uh, you know, it, it's often quite stressful in those situations where you have to deliver a public service without adequate resources. So I want to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge the, 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 the work that has been completed, particularly the resurfacing works around OMA. And one scheme I want to make particular mention of is the uh, carriageway developments and the walking and cycling path provision at the Glen Cam Road. Uh, Chair, you'll be aware that this council has been lobbying for that project uh, for decades, but it is truly astounding. And what you have achieved there is absolutely brilliant beyond my uh, wildest expectations. So I want to thank you for that. I also want to say that I do appreciate the DEA meetings that Connor and other members of staff attend and deal with our queries as councillors. But uh, my main question really uh, concerns uh, the, the major structural projects. First of all, in relation to uh, the A5, which has already been discussed briefly, I would say that in terms of your, uh, describing the current position, Daniel, you would say that uh, the preliminary options will be presented to the permanent secretary uh, within the next number of weeks, and then it will be for a minister or a senior civil servant to take that decision. So I welcome that because, uh, you know, we, we need that project urgently, as other members have said. Um, uh, these major projects don't come cheap. Uh, 85 kilometres, 1.6 billion projected cost. The uh, southern bypass for Enniskillen, 2.1 kilometres, 35 million. Whereas the uh, Cornamuck Improvement Scheme, 1.5 km kilometres, only 8.6 million. It's a, it's, it's, it's a large amount of money, but it appears rel relatively small in comparison to the other projects. And I know that you have uh, said in the current position that you the, the delivery of this scheme will really depend on the department emergency uh, emerging uh, priorities. But, you know, my question really is that the A5 has long been a priority. It was uh, the transportation from Oma to Enniskillen was one of the key factors in the siting of the acute hospital, which serves this district in Enniskillen. So uh, uh, why is that not a priority? Why has it, why has it not been prioritised? Because over the last almost 10 years, as, as a council, we have constantly been lobbying for those upgrades. We appreciate the realignments that have taken place. The A32 has been improved, but it's still far from being what we would regard as being acceptable for ill patients to travel uh, be, between Oma and District up to Enniskillen. It can be a, a, a life-saving journey. So my question is, what, you know, given the small, relatively small amount of money that's involved, for example, in the Cornamuck realignment, um, what, why is that not being progressed? Why is it not seen as a priority, given that it's been on the agenda for almost 10 years? Thank you. Thanks, George. Uh, thank you. Um, I would have to speak to my transportation colleagues to understand why the A32 wasn't included within the Major Works Project uh, prioritisation list. But my understanding is it's it's entirely down to budgets. Now, I take your point that 8.2 million um, is not a large amount of money. However, it, it does it more than exceed the structural maintenance budget for the entirety of Manor and Oma and um, other areas. So it, it's not an insignificant amount when it comes down to carrying out our duty to make sure the road network remains in a safe condition. Um, that's not to say that should a minister come in 
and immediately indicate that this is a priority for him or her, that that money would be top sliced from our budget because we're directed by the minister. So if a minister instructed us that the A32 was now a priority, then certainly that money would be found. But from a prioritisation and fulfilling our safety and legislative responsibility at the minute, it, it doesn't meet the criteria that has been set out to ensure that it sits with it with the other major works projects. And I, I completely take your point with regards to the movement of the hospital to Enniskillen. In my view, and this is just a personal view, there should have been a, a correlation between the move uh, and the appointment of monies to upgrade the A32. And my understanding is that that wasn't the case when the decision was made. Sorry, Daniel, that was the case, actually. Was the case? Yeah. And it was blatantly reneged on. That was, that was a confirmation. It was a, sorry, this is, this is my understanding. This, this is allocating future funds, which they didn't, it wasn't part of a multi-year budget settlement. It was just part of a, a essentially a part of the business case and the move. Am I correct? Devil's in the detail, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But I, I completely appreciate where you're coming from. Um, yeah. I, I personally, I would like to see all our projects receive the funding necessary to progress them. And moving forward, it may be the case that they become more difficult to justify based on the, the climate action plan and, and the transportation priorities that are coming out of the department's regional transportation strategy which is due for release in the next uh, short while. And I would encourage all councils to, to make a representation when that is released for consultation and try and shape it or guide it in a way that most suits your, your priorities. Schemes to actually up and go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Amory. Um, yes, thank yous and um, yous are welcome. And I know yous aren't long on your posts, some of yous there as well. And, um, just also want to thank the staff. I know I never had any issues. Um, I always got correspondence back, um, right and quick. And with Connor, I even called into the office one day and um, he came straight out, you know what I mean? So it's always been um, very open and receptive for myself and um, forthcoming. And as somebody else had said, alluded to earlier on, that we might not get the answers that we have, but it was always done in a nice, pleasant and forthful manner. You know what I mean? It wasn't aggression or nothing behind the scenes, so which is good um, to see working between us. But on the A32, yes, just want to come in on that as well. And it's good to see that you're having a review, an upgrade review. I think you had said it next year. So I think that's good. Maybe it's timely um, that um, whilst it's been mentioned quite a few times about the A32 um, hasn't been built. So it's good that there is a review going on and especially in light of the downgrading of Inniskeen Hospital um, with emergency services, med emergency general um, science or medicine there. And surgery, um, there is quite um, a percentage of patients which has been been removed from it, therefore increasing um, any traffic, you know, at high speeds, whatever. Just so it is imperative that that is the prepared route going from in the hospital through Oma rather than up over Scrahi. That is the prepared route that the the, the prepared route that um, that the ambulances do use. Not speaking on behalf of them, work for them, and not speaking on behalf of them, but. It is it is a better road, and especially coming into the winter conditions. So, it is um, good to see that the review has been taken and hopefully carried on. And it is a small amount of money, um, just in everything else. Um, just uh, it's not all what we're getting. Um, but from whenever I came in, a new councillor into a very rural um, area, which is um, high, steep, inclined, banking between valleys. Um, I can't believe just how bad the roads are actually out. In the backs of Gorch and Ruski, the, the, the Gorch and Hills, of the high slippage of the roads and the, and the huge crevices that's in them. And I have raised it before, you know what I mean? But it's going to be a long programme of work. There's been a lot of reduction in money and funds for the last 10, 12 years. And sadly, it's always coming back to use. But um, hopefully we're working more positively, more going forward. And yourselves who are new in the roads are probably actually getting out onto the roads to see that you know, where actually needs the money spent, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know what these back roads, somebody says, oh, they're having a high percentage of volume on them, but they're as just important as the rural dwellers of it is ever, everywhere else because, you know what, they're tramping over those roads maybe five times in the one day or they might only be 
30, 40 cars in the road, but those are for high priority, I think, than, than other roads, you know what I mean? Yeah, so thank you very much. Okay. Is that right? Eddie? Thanks, Chair, and just want to echo what people have said so far. Thank you for attending and for listening to us. Um, I'm sure um, you appreciate our point of view as well, and that we were here to represent our constituents and their concerns, but we also appreciate your budgetary issues uh, and the challenges that you face in the past few years. Um, the first thing I'm just going to, again, it's a broken record with A32, but uh, it's just an extra bit of detail discussed regarding the the use um or, or it's it's downgrading in terms of where it is in, in packing order for funding but has in that algorithm and obviously there was some kind of point scoring system for each project was the health aspect actually included in that algorithm um was that a part of the point scoring system that that the a32 was still downgraded upon against or was that omitted in the in the actual uh, assessment of the project because I think that's crucially important. Um, you know that that road is not just a road for the uh, upgraded for the sake of upgrading it. It, it is an important uh, health object objective as well, uh, and I think that would be a, a key thing to clarify if possible. Um, secondly, um, wanted to discuss just regarding the street lighting uh, and the funding that's going in. Let's see, that's two million pounds this year for this. Just in terms of uh, the functionality of those street lights, are they at this point all LED? Or, uh, there's are there any kind of um, energy efficiency that you can see, you know, in the in the project over the next few years? And if so, is that sort of being prioritised over other areas, or what would the priority priority of that two million pounds be? Thank you. No, well, uh, I can certainly check and see what the um, criteria was for setting out the list of. Um, major works priority schemes and come back to you. Um, with regards to the, the street lights, um, there's a Northern Ireland wide process at the minute of upgrading all street lights to LEDs. Um, the original program was to be completed within a couple of years, but due to budgetary and, and resource issues, um, it, it has elongated. Now, the, the two million that's mentioned there is primarily for for upgrading those and the main reason for doing so is to reduce the drain on resource monies that we have because as i'm sure you're aware over the last year and a half um energy prices have, have shot through the roof and and it's resulting in a much bigger drain on the department's resource budget than it did in previous years so that's the, the main reason for that two million as far as i understand it the program for the completion of the um, LED upgrade is due for completion next year, so hopefully, the, from an energy efficiency point of view, will be, will, will have hit our targets at that stage. Um, I don't think there's much room for further efficiencies. So you'll be aware that earlier this year there was the consultation as to whether we would turn off streetlights for periods during the night, and um, the result of that was that it would cost quite a lot of money to fix timers and to adjust all the street lights to allow that to happen so it was seen as as not really a uh, at this stage not really a uh, something to take forward okay thanks Annie. and mark uh, you're next and would you be so kind as to second the noting of uh first minute? yes no problem happy to second the yeah. noting chair and daniel you're very welcome and along with the rest of your officials and you know needless to say I mean, I'm sure we all go to you with all sorts of queries, and I do find you relatively responsive and helpful. And as it's been said before, even if the answers aren't the answers we would like, it's still better to get the answer nonetheless. Anyway, I appreciate tonight's very strategic and high level. So there are only three things whenever I was going through the report that I thought I'd ask on. Firstly, it relates to grass cutting. And I'm going to quote just there's a line on page seven of your report, and it states sight lines at bends and junctions will be cut as frequently as required to ensure public safety. That's not the case. That wasn't the case this year. I could bring you to countless junctions across Erin West, and I could have pointed to you, and I know I did send in some photographs of junctions that weren't safe, and they weren't safe in May, they weren't safe in June, and even right up until the middle of, in some place, the middle of July, they weren't safe. Um, and as a result, local landowners, local farmers had to take um, action into their own hands and make those junctions safe. And I remember, and I'll remember for a long time, the call that I got from a constituent, a young mother who had kids in the back seat of her car, who was driving along a main road within a very reasonable speed, and another car came out of a, an adjoining road. 
the sideline was completely blocked by long grass and it was an absolute near miss. I mean, it could have been a tragedy, an absolute tragedy. And the driver who was driving out was entirely apologetic, but his argument and the lady I was talking to had no reason to dispute it. He just couldn't see her and that's not safe. And I know in that instance, that junction was made safe by local people. So it's just, it's the first question would be in terms of, I mean, are you satisfied really that that line within that report is as accurate as it should be? Um, and are, you know, are we looking at the same thing next year realistically, or is there anything we can do or you could do to perhaps bring forward? I appreciate, you know, grass verges, one cut, two cut, that's, it is what it is. But when it comes to public safety, you know, exits and junctions are absolutely critical. So that's the first one. The second issue is in relation to roundabouts. Now, we all know what happened, or I suspect most of us know what happened in relation to roundabouts in Enniskillen, and this is specifically in Enniskillen earlier this year. I mean, I was contacted, I think it was around the middle of June, and at that stage, the council had planted roundabouts, a roundabout, perhaps more, in Enniskillen, the roundabout outside the library in Enniskillen, very prominent roundabout. The council then, within a day or two, instructed those same staff to go back and rip those plants out. And whenever I asked about that, the line was, well, it was a mistake. It shouldn't have been for the council. I mean, I'd be of the opinion it was a mistake for the council not to demonstrate the common sense in that case. But nonetheless, as a result, throughout the, throughout the summer, that particular roundabout looked like a jungle. It was an absolute disgrace. It was an eyesore and lots of people were talking about it. So my question would be, and this will help us as we move into the rate setting process, our DFI, and I suspect I know the answer, but are DFI, or are you guys planning to do anything differently in relation to roundabouts and maintenance roundabouts next year? Because if not, if the answer's no, I know it's an issue I'd like to take up with the council separately, but it would be useful to know at this stage whether DFI are planning anything different when it comes to maintenance and roundabouts. And then finally, the third issue is in relation to car parking. And this would be car parking along the main street in Enniskillen. Now, I appreciate that this council took a decision along with DFC and along, along with a lot of other stakeholders to enter into the public realm initiative that it did in Enniskillen. But when I look at that, and this is before I was even on the council, but whenever I look at that and when I talk to lots of people, there's a, lots, there's a lot of negativity in, in relation to that scheme in terms of there's lots of people who think the works have spoiled the town. They've taken away, greatly reduced the number of viable car parking spaces along the main street and along key car parks even include the likes of the, I think it's the Key Lane car park around that end of the town. So is there any, and whilst there's some positives, I absolutely welcome the fact that there's more additional car parking spaces now in Anniskillen, but even they, because the, the curbs now encroach so much out onto the road, there's so, there's so many fewer car parking spaces, even those disabled spaces, people are feeling, people out of frustration, and I know they shouldn't be doing it, but, but they're encroaching upon them, even them disabled spaces. So my question would be, and I'm not sure to be honest whether it's an issue for DFI or whether it's for the council, but it would be useful to know, is there, and I suspect DFI, even if you don't have the numbers now, you would have had them previously, but do we know how many car parking spaces there are along those main streets in Enniskillen before the public realms work and how that compares to the figure now? Okay, thanks, Mark. And before you go in there, Daniel, I'm just going to ask Alison to... Thank you, Chair. Chair, we do have the figures in terms of car parking spaces, so I can get those in the course of, of the meeting. But um, <clears throat> excuse me, just in relation to a couple of the specifics about the public realm scheme, and I suppose certainly your comments, Councillor Offens, wouldn't be uh, reflective of the majority of feedback that, that I would have received. I think it's important to differentiate, though, between the Keeley and North scheme and the public realm because they were two different. While DFC was a co-funder, uh, they were two different entities. The Keelian scheme was specifically to address antisocial behaviour um, and the scheme as developed was in direct consultation with the businesses and residents in the area and certainly the scheme that we now have and the revised layout has been successful in the context of feedback that we have received uh, from the businesses and from the residents and also from the police. Um, in terms of the um, overall uh, parking configuration within the public realm, my and as I say we'll quote the correct figures. My recollection is there has been a loss of I think it was twelve spaces in total. There has been a significant increase in the number of inclusive uh, or accessible spaces, which was another provision of the scheme. And I know we have correspondence coming in. I think it's uh, to the council meeting re yes next week 
on one of the provisions that was made in the public realm scheme was the redesignation of loading bays. So they are going to be now temporary uh, for loading and outside of those times will be for, for parking. But in the course, sorry, Chair, apologies for laryngitis, but in the course of as as um, uh, as the wider team are commenting, I'll certainly have the detail of the specific figures about the parking and I'll provide that now. OK, thanks, Alan. <laughs> Daniel? Yeah, um, you mentioned grass cutting at, at junctions and if there are junctions out there that were not cut, especially following any notification to DFI with regards to safety issues, then that's obviously um, uh, it's something that's been the ball's been dropped by ourselves there. Certainly, if it's notified to us that there are there are issues at junctions, then we're fairly proactive in instructing our contractor to go out and carry out the grass cuts. If there are specific areas that you 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 felt that weren't addressed, I'm more than ha happy to take them on from you and make sure that they are addressed in the future. Certainly, because obviously. As I mentioned in the report, it, it would be our intention to ensure that all junctions are safe for people to use and that a full visibility display is provided. So I can only apologise if that wasn't the case. Um, with regards to roundabouts, obviously in the past there's been agreements between ourselves and councils with regards to urban grassed areas and how often they're cut. Um, we don't differentiate between urban roundabouts or roundabouts and our grass cutting of verges. So the department's intention would be to maintain our current policy, which is once or twice cuts per year. Now, I know a number of areas have taken on um, sponsorship from local businesses and then works are carried out under often through the council, through their public liability to maintain those roundabouts. And that may be a, a, a route that could be explored a little little further. But from the department's point of view, um, our intention, we just don't have the money to, to, to maintain roundabouts any more than the one or two cuts that we provide all our areas. <clears throat> OK. Chair, sorry, just to note in, in relation to the uh, parking provision, the uh, increase was from 10. The exist pre-public realm scheme, there were 10 new badge places and the increased provision now is 21. Okay, Diana. Thank you, Chair. And um, just want to add my thanks to the team, Daniel and your team, for coming this evening and for your report. Um, public trans or the transport network, the roads are something that are used by absolutely everybody in the district for whatever reason from a baby that's going to a hospital appointment right through to school daily daily commute. So really with, with that in mind and, and looking at the, the upcoming winter service, I, you know, I note in the, the document, the gritting under the winter service there, um, it states that 300 employees are on standby to grit from October to April. Now that's, I take it, throughout all of Northern Ireland. But when you look at page 39, there are 18 for Fermanagh and Oma, and unless I'm mistaken, I think this district has the largest road network in all of Northern Ireland. You know, um, I did a quick check, um, if my figures are right, I think it's something like 1,651 A, B and C roads and 2,333 unclassified roads. Um, so really, I, I just would like to know, are you satisfied that 18 employees and 13 gritters is proportionate to our need in the district for the winter service, um, absolutely essential. Um, the second point I wanted to make, and it was something raised at Council, was the prohibition to the Dublin Road right-hand turn. This may come up in correspondence, and I had actually asked for, I made a request for a meeting um, to discuss that, and I just wonder if you had any um, update on that. It was an offer um, to meet with the network development section to discuss that. And in relation to that, and I did see somewhere in the report, the traffic lights at Derachara are being moved to a cloud system. Will that integrate satisfactorily with the proposed prohibition and the expected change in traffic circulation there near that particular site? Um, because I thought in the actual documents with that planning application that the traffic lights were to be moved again. 
I could well be wrong in that, but that was the impression I got on that. Um, thirdly, uh, you did mention, and, and I, was, I was going to ask about the vacancies, because something I'd raised before, the difficulty you have in attracting staff, and Councillor Dehan did acknowledge how stressful it is for your employees as well and for yourselves. Um, I'd be interested to know also the proportion of the works budget spent on external contractors um, and where you see that going. Is that something really in the future, more and more external contractors being being used? Um, finally, really on a lighter note, um, I just see it mentioned once in the report, it's potholes. And I was really interested to see, and I, I've lost track of the pothole machine um, experiment and if there was an update on that, because I just can't remember if we got one. Thank you. Thanks, Tiana. Okay. Um, certainly with regards to the, the uh, what's available to us in Malaroma from the gritting um, point of view, the, the gritting routes were agreed and First of all, I suppose I should lay out, and it's probably something you already know, that the gritting of the schedule isn't a legislative requirement for the department. However, it's it's obviously it's something that, that needs to be done. And the gritting routes throughout Northern Ireland, the extent of gritting that is agreed, was agreed with the Assembly. So any change to the gritting routes and the volume of gritting routes needs a ministerial approval. So what we've done is we've... Um, evaluated what the gritting routes are and made our staff complement and gritter numbers uh, the most effective way of carrying out those routes so they're all completed within three to four hours of um, being called out. So from that point of view, I am satisfied that the number of gritters available in Fermanaroma is suitable for the amount of the gritted network that we're responsible for in this area. Now that doesn't um, take into account really the, the difficulties sometimes we have, especially if there's industrial action in carrying out a full grit of all those routes as many times as we would like to do so. And that may well be the case again this winter that we encountered last winter where unfortunately we we're only resourced to carry out a single grit of the gritted routes, whereas we would like to carry out multiple um, gritting operations. But yeah, uh, to, to go back to your original question, I'm satisfied that the, the number of gritters and the staff that we have in Fermanagh and Omer is adequate for the gritting routes that we're currently responsible for. <coughs> Sorry, the Dublin Road right-hand turn, is that with a planning permission? Is that, yeah, I'm going to have to speak to my DC colleagues with regards to getting back to you on that one, if that's okay. Um. <coughs> You mentioned that. Um, Sorry, Daniel. I just let. It's just to know, Chair, we are progressing, Daniel, with your team a, a site meeting or a, a, a meeting for members, and we are going to include planning officers because it is something uh, that was conditioned uh, approval. Now, it's specifically about the junction and the correspondence. Um, I don't know whether either Daniel or maybe Brian would wish to comment specifically on the traffic light configuration with with Derry Chara, but uh, that that may be an additional consideration. They, we were meeting actually with the consultants and that the traffic lights are staying in that location. We're just upgrading them as all the traffic lights in Inniskillen are actually upgraded. So as they work better with different traffic flows through the town. So it should leave it that things flow a wee bit easier. And just sorry, on the 18 as well, that's actually 18 per shift per night. They, so they like it tonight there at 7 o'clock. Between Fermanagh and Oma, there's 18 men and women. The out on that shift, and then tomorrow morning there'll be another different eighteen. Off the cover clock is another set of eighteen. So it just it takes eighteen people between supervisors and one thing and another to do do our roads first. Okay, Tony. Thanks for clarifying that, Brian. Um, <clears throat> certainly, from an uh, an employment point of view, you mentioned whether the we would what the volume of our use of external contractors is. Um, unfortunately, over the past number of years, with our internal operations um, uh, unit, who carry out a lot of the works for us, has shrunk in size, and that's just due to funding issues and um, engaging new staff as well in an environment where, in the private sector, it can often be more lucrative for road workers to, to operate with external con contractors. So more and more of our 
um, operations are being carried out by external contractors. Now, a number of our operations have always been carried out by external contractors, less so in the Fmanaran uh, OMA area, where we had our internal resource to carry out our surface dressing. But with the uh, aging of our fleet and the reduction in our manpower in the future, I can see that that will also and in fact, it, it is moving in that direction where we're putting out a tender for our surface dressing to be provided by an external contractor now as well. So you're right, uh, there is a, a, a gradual lessening of internal resource with regards to our operations and maintenance staff. And quite often, we appreciate that, that they can often do a, a superior job and certainly we can manage them probably better. But it's just the way that um, things have, have gone over the last number of years, unfortunately. That's not to say that uh, the external contractors aren't very good themselves. Um, the Pothole Pro, uh, uh, obviously we're all out at the demonstration, or a number of us were earlier this year. And I think it, it demonstrated that it is a particularly good piece of equipment for a certain type of work. Now, the type of work that we're forced to carry out at the minute with regards to filling individual potholes that are fairly small scale and then moving on to another one that may not be terribly close to the original one, um, it was decided by our uh, internal operations and maintenance colleagues and by our con contractors that the current method of managing the pothole uh, burden is best done with their existing equipment. But the Pothole Pro does have a place in a certain type of re uh, repair, not necessarily the small scale ones, but not large scale, but sort of medium scale ones. Um, so it probably does have a place, but unfortunately, um, for the type of work that we currently carry out, it, it's just not appropriate, or it was deemed not appropriate. Okay, thank you. Uh, John? Uh, thanks, Chair. No, I just wanted to highlight on the uh, pedestrian measures locations. I see you are doing design complete and the land acquisition in Balik from um, Rockville Gardens to Black Rock. And loath as I am to uh, speak against something being done in my local area, it's just there is a footpath the whole way from Rockville Gardens to Black Rock on the other side of the road. And I've been involved in local politics for the best part of 25 years and canvases and stuff. And when I speak to the people in Bleak, they, they talk about traffic calming measures. They talk about bringing the speed limit down to 20 miles an hour at one of the local schools. They talk about a footpath from the main street of Bleak up to the health centre. They talk about improving the road down to the marina. They talk about traffic calming measures out at the uh, Corrie School. In those 25 years, no one has ever asked me about the footpath from Rockfield to Black Rock on the other side of the road. They talk about extending the, the one they have and stuff. I, I'm just using this as maybe as a slight analogy of the, there may be a slight disconnect between your organization and the residents who live in Fermanagh. So I just thought I'd highlight it. Thank you. I mean, Certainly, we try to engage with councillors and, and local representatives and, and locals with regards to where we do target our active travel schemes. Um, and also, now we have in the back of our mind that there's a, a broader active travel and cycle network, pedestrian cycle network, that's been carried out for all of Northern Ireland, uh, a project to, um, to identify the future of active travel carried out by Atkins. So that, that may factor into it. But certainly with regards to that, I'd like to think that there would be a significant amount of engagement. And if there are other areas that um, you or, or any of the locals feel active travel measures would be more appropriate, then we'd certainly be receptive in, in identifying those areas and, and redirecting monies and, and design resource to those areas, if appropriate. Okay, thank you. Ante? Uh, thank you, Chair. And I just want to make one or two comments as well and one question. And it's just going to start off here. I'm very worrying stats there that Seamus read out at the start of the meeting. There's very worrying for the residents of Fermanagh that we are being left behind because we can get no contact. So hopefully um, we do a bit of catch up and get some of the roads there in Garrison and Balik and 
they're gone and leave Belku area and Bowman here. Very bad um, stay at the roads right at the minute. And I know you're doing your best to keep the potholes and all that fixed, but very bad now. So it's, it's very worrying that that will shame us right out there in the start. It was just one question I was I was just wondering about. It's about street lighting, and I know you saw you saw going around replacing a lot of the street lights, which is good to see and good to see progress being made. But there was one of the roads in my area that put new street lighting on them, and they just didn't go up as far as the old street light was. A good, a fair distance back of it, you know, which, which was disappointing. I tried, and I did contact DFA Road, and they got back to me and said they couldn't do it. Like, but it's just disappointing. I think in future, when they are replacing the street lights, they want to go to the exact same place as where the old old lamp post was as well. It just happened to be close to an elderly woman that's living on her own, and. She will it'd be more darkness there than it was. So it's just I just in the future just go exactly to where, where you went well, well, with the with the old pole, poles. And I just see them on page twenty-eight as well. It's about street lighting. The Kerr Road Gavahi, it says there, a, a, a new scheme. And I, I thought the DFA what wasn't putting in new new lights for this last while. I was just wondering, are they back doing it now? Or was that some of the the contractors on that? And um, just Diana touched on it too about, about the gritting. I know they're, they're living in a rural area myself. We don't we don't get the road gritted at all, but we get the, the wee grit piles out there, and they're out there at the minute. So so it's um, I suppose it's better than nothing. But I was just um, contacted there about a year ago. Um, somebody not far from me um, passed away, and we were trying to get the road gritted for the morning of the funeral. But I was told we'd stop doing that because I mean, I mean previously I did ring about it now three years before that and fair play that the guys came out and grit the road that morning. The local undertaker has always ring me up just right around that time, you know. So it's just it's a, it's a pity we still couldn't do that. I just want to comment from that from maybe Brian or somebody would if there was a a, a, a wake or funeral would, would they grit the road at the day of the funeral to two days around that for it was um. Lucky enough that that morning of the funeral, it, it, it wasn't as bad as it, as it could have been, and, and the funeral went on ahead with the, the, the road and that. But I think we should still be providing that service to people, even if we're not getting our roads graded all the time. If there's a, any like that there, that we should be. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Thank you. And no, I take your point with regards to the um, replacement of street lighting. If, if street lighting was provided to a certain, a certain point uh, within an urban area, then Certainly, we would try to provide a similar standard all the way to that area that it was previously, unless there were um, issues that I'm not aware of that, that prevented that. But no, I take your point, and I certainly take that back to my colleagues in street lighting. Um, with regards to, you mentioned Co Road and Gravahi and the street lights. Is it, I'm just, I'm not sure what the, the point you were, you were making. Was it the fact that they're, they're, ones that had been provided previously were temporary and, and they've been upgraded. This is a new scheme. Is this on page 28 there? Is this new new scheme? The, or, uh, the, the DFA roads is still putting in new lights on roads if, if you look for the mother? Or I thought, uh, do we quit doing that? Or? Well, no, street lights would be provided um, where they're appropriate. They would, they would be. You know, oh. if, if an assessment was carried out and that it's generally to do with the number of uh, houses within a certain area. If the number of houses within a certain area exceeds a certain density, then they're within our policy. We're liable to provide street lighting. Oh. If, if if they don't meet that density, then generally you'll get a neg negative response. But okay. with regards to Gavahi, it didn't meet um, our policy. However, we were instructed uh, by the then minister to provide street lighting in Gravahi. Okay. I can kind of comment about the gritting as well, please. Or yeah. Um, certainly with regards to gritting, what we tend to do is we concentrate on the primary gr uh, gritting network. So once the primary gritting network is complete, if we have resources and if drivers are available after that is complete and made safe, then if we have the resources, then we do try to respond to um, particular issues like some of the secondary gritting routes um, include, and also in response to, to funerals or, or events if we have the resources to do so. So that, that still would be the case. The downside is at the minute we have so few drivers that generally we don't have the resource to carry out that. But if we do, we certainly will carry it out. Okay, thanks. Norling? 
Hello, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Daniel and the team for coming in, giving us this report. I just want to get back to, you mentioned contractors earlier and responses. Um, I've had a couple of responses about particular jobs that uh, have said that it's been passed on to the contract and you cannot give any more information. And I just found that left it up in, in the air a little bit. I mean, surely just because it's been passed to a contractor, surely you would have um, engagement with them over that particular job. And just wanting to highlight, sometimes it seems, even though Paddy Curran, who contacts me, you know, does his best to get responses back to me, sometimes it, it, the emails do seem a little bit, well, that's, that's been passed to the contractor, so there's nothing we can do, which leaves me as a council up in the air. And I just wanted to see if you could respond to that, really. Yeah. No, and, and sometimes the, all we can do is pass on it to the contractor and then they have to program it within their, you know, taking into account the resources they have available and where their work gangs are when they carry that out. Now, what I'd like to think is that if we do pass it to the contractor and we follow up, if if you're looking for additional information and and we follow up with the contractor to identify where that sits within their program, we can get a more of a, a more dedicated time frame to you. But I, I suppose we receive so many queries and that's a good thing. Well, in some ways it's a good thing because it shows the engagement that we have with, with yourselves. Um, but we receive such a, a significant amount that sometimes I suppose staff give out what they think is an appropriate response, but it's not what you're looking for. So if there are issues where that becomes the case, then if you come back to us and look for a little bit more detail, then we'll do our best to come back to you and, and give you a more tighter time frame. Yeah, um, that's that's I appreciate that. Um, as I said, it does. I do get responses eventually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it just seems that sometimes I just wanted to holler. I do have to fight for more information. Where just a little bit of an update now and again yeah. would really go a long way. So I can pass that on to the constituents that have been asking me about a particular issue. I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, Debbie? Um, thanks, Chair. Yeah, it's just a, a, a quick question, really. We were asked to send any um, issues we had on the forms before 10 a.m. this morning. Um, so obviously I'm not expecting you to answer me now to the queries the four queries that I did send in but I'm um I haven't had any responses yet so I'm not sure why I had to send them in before 10 o'clock this morning but I'm just wondering who who deals with them who is the contact if I want you know if I don't have an answer by this time next week who am I actually contacting to get a response because I sent that to democratic services in the council so who did they send that to who who are the contacts that we that, you know, that we need to be able to follow up on these queries, please. If you're looking to follow up on the queries, I'm more than happy for you to contact myself, but those queries themselves will be addressed by my colleagues sitting in front of me. So Brian and, and Connor receive all the queries that were filled in on those pages and they'll, they'll issue a response directly to yourselves. Okay. But if, but if they're not, then I'm more than happy for you to contact me and I'll make sure that they do. Okay, and we have email addresses for you guys? Yeah, the, yeah, certainly with regards to, you can contact, you can identify the emails through uh, Democratic Services. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Debbie. Seamus, I'm reluctant here unless it's uh, a very brief and worthwhile comment here, Seamus. I will cut you off if I don't uh, feel it's worthwhile. Uh, thanks, Chair, very much. Uh, it was just on the street late when Daniel said that they are putting in new uh, where there's need. Uh, I have had a, a couple of uh, street lighting issues. One, the Skeg Road in Brookborough, who uh, seven, eight years ago, road service told me, yes, it met all the criteria. Uh, and if they were allowed to put in street lighting, they would indeed put in street lighting there. But they said there was a, a that Starman had a mor moratorium on new street lighting, 
and that you weren't allowed they were not allowed to put in new street light but on this here on page 28 there's a new scheme and daniel's after confirming to me that uh, road service are indeed putting in new street lighting so i am now delighted to know that and i will be expecting somebody from road service out to the skag road in brookborough now that this moratorium has been lifted and that that scheme will now be scheduled do you want to confirm that for seamus daniel then well i'll certainly uh come back to you on it seamus because I'm, I'm not aware of that particular one in Brookborough, so I'd have to speak to my colleagues. About and it. are you aware of when the moratorium was lifted, or was there indeed ever a moratorium? I'd have to check on that for you as well. Okay, cheers, Daniel. Diana, the same courteous. Thank you for extending the courtesy to me. Um, just one question I did mean to ask, Daniel, was on the adoption of new developments. I mean, we're sitting in our north with with two. I can think of in particular, Cash and Irvinstown. That you know, it's the developers are given every opportunity. I know maybe it's moving to another agency as well. Um, but have you seen any progress? Is this something that is being that is likely to be dealt with once an executive is back in place? Um, because um, we know there are also there are also other um, new developments within. And Skillen in particular that have caused a lot of problems with adoption. So it's it's just so frustrating that this is rolling on and on. Some of these are 20 plus years, and I, I probably mentioned them last time. No, and you're right, there is a, a, a significant backlog of developments that haven't received adoption status, either because the roads infrastructure isn't up to standard or the NI water infrastructure isn't up to standard. And I am aware that there is a, a an ongoing process looking to engage with an external provider to pursue contract or developers to reduce the backlog um, and that's currently in the process of going through the department of finance so there is that our development control and private streets teams are also looking to uh, reduce the backlog but again they're under the same resource constraints that the rest of the department are under and and they have new developments and new inspections to be carried out and that limits the amount of time that they can spend going back on these developments and the reason that they are in the backlog is because generally the bonds that are there are insufficient to carry out the works that are necessary to to complete the adoption process and i suppose a decision has to be made where the public money is released to allow us to carry out the works to bring them up to an adoption standard and then adopt them and that, unfortunately, is a is a decision for for the assembly. I think. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. I appreciate you've just arrived in. Did you, if you had any question, you're the last speaker. If you had anything, otherwise, we're going to close this section. Uh, isn't that very good of you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with that. Um, we are going to have democratic services pass out the email addresses for the uh, DFI roads people, so that'll that'll be done. Daniel, uh, Connor, and and uh, Brian, thank you very much for attending, and uh, we look forward to following up with you on the different bits and pieces that we have here. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to our correspondence. And we have uh, one piece of correspondence here, one and the other as well, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair. So, Chair, the first item is from the Northern Ireland Office, and this is regarding the recruitment of independent members to the Northern Ireland Policing Board. Um, this specific request from the, the uh, uh, Secretary of State here, Chair, is the proposal just at the start of the second page of the letter to introduce competency uh, based requirements associated with the next recruitment phase for independent members. Um, so those will be the requirement for candidates to demonstrate ability in organisational leadership, strategic focus, relationship management and influence and financial performance. Um, the Council has, we're a statutory consultee and we have until the 4th of December 2023 uh, to comment if we have any concerns on this proposed amendment, Chair. Okay, 
Thanks, Alison. Uh, Stephen? I propose to note that, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Mark? Thank you, Chair. And I'm happy to second the note if necessary. And I mean, just in terms of what the Chief Executive has just talked about, I mean, I know personally, myself and the Balfour Air Group, we have no difficulty in introducing competency based tests. Um, and particularly, I mean, I would absolutely share the broad sentiment with this letter in terms of it is especially important for those critical public bodies such as the policing board to have the right sort of people at the top because really a public body is only as strong as its, bo is, as its board in a way um, so I'd be happy to um, support what's being proposed within the letter and chair if I can make a proposal tonight as well I know it's slightly outside the NIO but it's connected to the contents of this letter too um, I would like to propose chair that tonight we agree to write to the new chief constable of the PSNI just really to congratulate them on congratulating him on his appointment and wishing him well for the future. And I think it would be a useful opportunity as well, just as a council, to express our continuing support and gratitude for the all the PSNI teams, both officers and civilians, locally across Fermanagh and Oma. I think that would be useful. And even the fact, Chair, that this Chief Constable and the PSNI over the last couple of weeks haven't been in the headlines every day shows that the current Chief Constable, John Boucher, the new one, is head and shoulders above the person he replaced. Um, and then secondly, Chair, never to waste an opportunity with a letter. I think it would be useful if in the same letter we could then write to him and again express our concern or disappointment about what's been happening with the custody suite in Enniskillen. I know it was an issue that was raised a number of years ago. Promises were made about renovations that were subsequently broken. And I know then in recent times that with the renovation going on currently underway in Oma, that now presents an additional challenge. I mean, I, I was in Enniskill Police Station a few weeks ago, only for a meeting, but quite a, for quite a period of time. And I saw the custody suite and it's a bit of a white elephant and it's a bit of a shame. And, you know, I don't know if any other policing districts in Northern that don't have a custody suite. So if someone's arrested in Belcoo or Bleak or Rossley, well, Belcoo or Bleak, particularly the extremities of the area like that, it seems an awful long way away. To the nearest custody suite. So, Chair, I propose to be right to the new Chief Constable, congratulating them, wishing them well, wishing the local members well, and then, but then also asking for support and expressing an opinion that we'd like to see that custody suite back up and going. Okay, have I a seconder? John, thank you. Are we all agreed? Young Barry? Are we yeah, go? It's very important to also reflect that. We have the right to criticise the PSNA when appropriate. And one of my constituents has written to me today to say, for example, that the PSNA uh, interference in the inquest into the murder of Sean Brown, you know, is disgraceful and, uh, you know, needs to be brought up at every level in society. There are other examples, other cases. So, again, you know, uh, the, the the constituent who has written to me is a retired solicitor, and has said PS and I have no business commenting on inquests, courts, because it does amount to political interference. And I know that there would be widespread concern in the community about the PS and I intervention in that case, and many other related cases. So I need to put that on the record because the people out there matter. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Barry. Seamus. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, and Sir Alvin's there mentioned, you know, people were arrested in, I think it was Balik and Rosley. I was thinking, you know, there was quite this, uh, probably people could be arrested in Kyasha, Balnamala or the other, so just to throw it out there. I, can I just confirm that we, we are all in agreement of that letter being sent? Excellent. Okay, thank you. And moving on to our other folder. Thank you, Chair. Um, and it was indirectly re related to, or sorry, referenced by the DFI team. This is corresponds from the Department for Infrastructure and the Joint Parking Strategy work. Uh, this is work that has been mentioned previously through the, the LDP Working Group as part of the Fermanagh and Oma Transport Plan. So in summary, the Department is uh, requesting, proposing really that that work would continue. Uh, they will support and fund the work. Uh, ACOM will be appointed and we would be providing ongoing reports through the planning uh, LDP working group in the first instance here. So recommending the, that the corresponds would be noted, but that we would pursue um, this course of action, which complements the previous uh, work undertaken in this area. Okay, 
Josephine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alison, for your report. Um, I'd like to propose to note, uh, Chair, thank you. OK, how about a seconder? John Finley, thank you. Are we all agreed? OK, moving on to ALB, Paul. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in here. You know, it's to do with the Coldbrook River. I had several people contact me in the last couple of weeks about the mouth of the Coldbrook River. It's not designated by the Rivers Agency. They moved the designation back farther up the Coldbrook River. The whole mouth was, is jammed with trees and uh, rubbery uh, leaves and stuff. And it's going to cause big flooding on the Coldbrook River back up in the Alandara, you know, up, up the river. So could we write a letter to Rivers Agency to take a look at this here and get it dragged or cleaned or whatever they want to do with it? I think it was about 15 years from the done before. OK, thanks, Paul. Seamus? Yeah, I want to second that proposal. I know Rivers Agency is saying now it's not designated that part of the Coldbrook River, but they did clean it, as Paul says, 15 years ago. So like they have responsibility for it. They just can't wash their hands. Uh, after all, they are the Rivers Agency. OK, are we all agreed, members? OK, Alison? Thank you, Chair. Chair, the second item of any other business is a request from the Friends of Loch McCrory, and this is in relation to uh, letters of support for an application they are compiling for the Community Ownership Fund. Um, and really the two matters that the, the group are keen that we convey in the letters of support. Firstly, this relates to uh, a long term. The Council has leased a, a former football pitch uh, to the association that they are proposing to develop. Um, for the council to confirm that we have no strategic uh, use or financial proposals attached to the facility. And secondly, that the proposal in question would complement the overall recreation and community output for the facility. So that, that's the request, Chair, and we'd be recommending that the letters of support issue accordingly. OK. Uh, Potterkin. Happy to propose. Thank you. Marie, are we all agreed, members? OK. Thank you. And now that's all our other, any other business? There's nobody else, I don't think so, no. Um, Councillor McHildoff. Barry. Thank you, Chair. Um, Scrieve me, Huggard. I wrote to you just prior to 6 p.m. this evening, but I do appreciate you're, you've been in transit. You've been very busy, and I would hate to detract from that busyness, you know. But... Uh, Discretion is my <laughs> middle name. <laughs> but uh, I suppose the issue I want to raise uh, relates to um, changes to this building, you know, changes to this building that may or may not be about to be taking place and, uh, you know, seeking an update on, I think it might be a consultation or a plan to decant certain sections of the council from the Grange Council offices to meet working environment or health and safety requirements, uh, as I understand it. Now, I know we've had a discussion about the wider estate strategy and, you know, we haven't gone beyond that just yet. So some people are confused at why that would be pressed ahead with in the absence of a report on the wider estate strategy. But from an OMA point of view, from an OMA town councillor point of view, I just want to restate the importance, the civic importance of this building you know it's like the town hall in Enniskillen we have two um, civic headquarters within this council area and anything that would happen you know till um, till decant uh, units of the council from here you know it would be important for the councillors to receive an update for the elected members and to have uh, an input to that you know for example I think we have to meet the working environment kind of regulations uh, in regards to heating, etc., that type of thing. But can that be achieved in a in a more cost effective, practical, uh, practical way? But also I want to highlight the symbolic importance as well as practical of the civic headquarters in OMA at this time. Thank you. 
Okay. Chair, if I can maybe comment on a couple of aspects, because this is something we will actually be reporting to members on and we'll respond to various issues. But I think as Councillor McEldoff has advised, there's probably at least two two strands. The first is in relation to the um the, the building itself. And as we reported through the October Regeneration and Community Committee meeting, there is a difficulty uh, with heating in the building specifically because of the windows and associated insulation and other issues. And as a result of that, uh, there are a number of uh, concerns around health and safety and, and our own working conditions for staff here, particularly in some parts of the building. Um, so what we're looking at at the moment is how that is uh, best addressed. There may be some short term options around heating or other matters which we're considering. There may, however, and it will be somewhat dependent on the weather, be a requirement uh, that we will have to decant staff to more suitable working conditions. Uh, the Council has um, at the Regeneration and Community Committee, it was recommended that we proceed with the replacement of windows and it was requested that that work be or a decision on that matter be paused or deferred until the wider estate strategy a review is completed and undertaken. That work is at a, a good and an advanced stage and I'd anticipate that that would be coming to members probably in January. But to answer the second part of uh, Councillor McEldoff's uh, queries or concerns, all of the work that uh, we have been undertaking in relation to the estate strategy is predicated on the basis of two civic headquarters, the Grey in Genoma, the Town Hall in Enniskillen. I do think there is provision for us to reduce our estate more generally, but it wouldn't be for either of those two buildings, which I suppose is why the original recommendation in October was that we do need to replace the windows in this building. Um, in terms of the logistics and what this actually means, we will be seeking to minimise disruption as far as possible, but there will be some inevitable disruption both for staff and also for members. And that's why we would, you know, obviously there would be some impact on our meeting arrangements, but we would be working on the basis chair that we will be able to retain our normal council and committee meeting provision uh, even during the works, if and when the council approve those uh, for the Grange and uh, will. Uh, we will report the detail of that in due course. In terms of a time scale for that work, it is somewhat dependent of the, sorry, the decant, it is somewhat dependent on the temperatures, but we would be working on the basis of seeking to look at alternate heating or decant arrangements either immediately before or after the Christmas break. Okay, thank you, Chair, for indulging me to reply. Further reply, um, I welcome the restatement, you know, of the commitment uh, to the two civic headquarters, OMA and Dennis Galen, because those issues do be raised, you know, um, and uh, it's important to, to restate that. And again, um, just to seek an assurance that anybody who's likely to be impacted with this, that there would be uh, proper communication with them and uh, thank, uh, thank the Chief Executive for intervention. And just to say, Chair, in your absence, I think Councillor McCann was in Dennis Galen, but I was in OMA the other evening at the light switch on it, it was a tremendous occasion with a very large crowd of participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Earl, you appreciate this as any other business. So I'll let, I, I know I don't bring speakers in to, I don't bring in speakers to speak out. So, uh, okay, we are going to, um, yes, let's go into committee. So I need a proposal to go in, Anthony. And Josephine, thank you.
we are out now. So I just ask Alison to give us a little resume of business in committee. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, while in committee, the Council considered a report on a call-in of a decision taken at the Council meeting on the 7th of November and resolved a course of action in, related to the, in, sorry, in relation to that decision and also received an update on an unrelated uh, legal matter. OK, thank you, Alison. I need a proposal. Thing. Proposal second, just to note, Diana, thank you, and Bernard, thank you. OK, members, that concludes the meeting. Thank you all for your cooperation and safe home. Thank you very much. Nice.